to zoom up, you know. We're good to go. Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to MRC's Lunch and Learn. Today is Tuesday. I don't even know what the date is, but thank you for being here at the Lagoon House in Palm Bay, and thank you to those who are joining us on Zoom. Uh, my name is Lisa Soto. I'm the Executive Director of the Marine Resources Council. Happy New Year, everybody. I'm excited about what we have going on at MRC and what we have to look forward to this year in the future. I um, want to thank you and recognize the many people who have made our organization a success. We had an outstanding end of year giving campaign, uh, bringing in over $80,000 at the end of the year. So thank you for your generous contributions. Uh, any donations and any amount will make you a member of the organization. So we currently have almost 1,000 members of MRC, annual members. Um, and we want to welcome you and your friends uh, to our team as a member of the organization, working to protect, restore, unite, and promote our coastal community and bring our Indian River Lagoon back into balance. Um, we have, a, I'd like to make a couple of announcements. First of all, if you haven't had a chance to sign MRC's vision statement. It's those imagine posters that you see in the back of the room. I uh, encourage you to come to the Lagoon House and sign our vision that we share with the community to bring our lagoon back to balance by the year 2050. Um, if you um, are online uh, right now, you can you can see it when we're out and about at events. We bring them with us, or you can come to the Lagoon House and sign it. I'm also really delighted that we have the Indian River Lagoon calendars from the National Estuary Program. They're absolutely beautiful. We have them here today. So if you're in the room, you can grab one. If you're not, come by the Lagoon House. Do call to make sure we're here and pick up your Indian River Lagoon National Estuary Program calendar. Um, the photos are absolutely, absolutely beautiful, as they always are. A couple of announcements. We are uh, MRC and, um, and the partners are holding and facilitating a seagrass assembly bringing together over 50 of the regions, actually the state's leading seagrass scientists to try to tackle, you know, how are we gonna restore the, the loss of seagrass in the Indian River Lagoon? We know that in, nobody has done a restoration effort of this magnitude before. We need to learn from our experiences and really what's gonna be key to success is those feedback loops. Do the research, collect the data, and share that information. Did it work? And did it, more importantly, what did not work, which is often something that scientists have a hard time sharing with others, you know, when things don't work the way they're expected to work. But we need to know. If we're going to get this right, we need to know what's working and what's not working. So we'll be holding that conversation on the 26th and 27th right here at the Lagoon House with select delegates that are the experts in seagrass science. You have an opportunity to meet those scientists if you're interested in, in uh, coming to our first Lagoon Side chat. It will be Thursday, January the 26th. Um, after the assembly finishes day one, you'll get a chance to meet the scientists, to interact with them. We'll be celebrating their hard work over those two days and uh, having some appetizers and drinks and uh, some music and so on and really celebrating their hard work. Uh, and you can help support that effort with your really small donation to attend that, our first, what we're calling Lagoon Side Chats for members to come, bring a friend and learn about what we're doing. That is Thursday, January the 26th, here at the Lagoon House starting at 5 p.m. This Saturday, so just a few days from today, um, Cara Woods, our Lagoon Watch coordinator, is going to be holding, she's in the back waving, uh, she's going to be holding a Lagoon Watch open house. Lagoon Watch is our uh, regular, our, our 30 plus year long volunteer water quality monitoring network. Uh, those um, individuals collect samples and analyze them for six different parameters off of their docks or at a public location every week. And we go through a quality assurance procedure to make those data as valid as possible. And I'm pleased to say that because of the need for restoration to have 
you know, a lot of data, particularly on two of the main parameters that we're collecting with Lagoon Watch, we need to expand that network because this seagrass needs, we need to know what are the salinity values, what are the dissolved oxygen values, and we've got the finest scale data. We've got more data points in the lagoon than any other monitoring effort, and, and it's collected weekly. So it's getting more and more and more key and more important. So you do need to commit to at least one year of data collection. Um, however, if you're interested in learning more, or you're interested um, in meeting others who do it, or if you are a Lagoon Watch coordinator and you need your quality assurance uh, samples, please attend Saturday. It's here at the Lagoon House from 10 to 1230. I'm sure Cara will be um, a, a wonderful hostess and have snacks and so on. Um, and you will learn about the program and delicious coffee. If you try the coffee, that's Cara coffee. It's the best. Okay. And I think that's my responsibility for uh, introducing what we're working on. Now I get to have the the great honor, privilege, and um, delight to, to introduce um, two of our friends and partners from Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute, Florida Atlantic University. Um, the first is our presenter today, Steve Burton, who is the director of the Stranding and Population um, Assessment Program at Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute. And then I believe he's going to introduce, is that right? Sam McGuire, who is their Outreach and Marine Education Specialist um, in, uh, at FAU Harbor Branch. So um, without further ado, I will bring Steve up to start the presentation. Thank you, Steve, for being here. Can we give him a round of applause? Thank you very much. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. And I know there's some people on Zoom, so it may be a good morning to you on the cyber world. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about the FAU Stranding and uh, Population Assessment Team. And we'll just jump right on in. All right. All right, a little bit about my background. I grew up in Southern California, a big surfer. Uh, that's how I got in the field. I love marine mammals, but I like all animals. Um, I want to thank my mom because she always took me to the beach in school. Um, and so I wanted a career working with marine mammals, and I ended up being a dolphin trainer and a sea lion trainer. And I did that for about 13 years out in Hawaii. Um, and then as you grow older, uh, you start to use your experience in the marine mammal field um, under human care, the facilities like that, to help the wild animals. So I've been uh, at Harbor Branch 13 years this April doing strandings and response. Um, I'm the lucky person that gets to give the talk today from our team, but I can't do it with all these other folks. This is our FAU Harbor Branch stranding team. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Annie Page Carjan, or my co i uh, but our uh, clinical veterinarian on our team. And then I have six amazing staff members from Wendy, um, Lydia, Brooke, Nicole, Tracy, and Lauren. And uh, we do this 24-7, 365 days a year. So get ready. Uh, we do use volunteers, and I can talk about that after the program. And obviously, Sam will probably talk about volunteers for her program as well. And so for those that don't know where Harbor Branch is, or if you're watching from somewhere else on Zoom, uh, never been to Florida, we are located on the Indian River Lagoon. We're on the southeast side of Florida in St. Lucie County. And what makes our uh, facility amazing is we're right on the river, so we can launch our boats straight into the river. But we're also four miles north of Fort Pierce Inlet. So as you're going to learn today, we also do uh, photo ID offshore and then also work with whales offshore. So having the ability to just launch our boat at Harbor Ranch and go straight out the inlet is fantastic for our team. All right. Our response area. Well, we respond to dolphins and whales that strand or are in distress or get called in for Indian River County, St. Lucie County and Martin County. So that's our home area. That's what we're responsible for. But we go all over the state of Florida when called upon by our stranding partners or National Marine Fisheries. We work with marine mammals. They're protected by law through the Marine Mammal Protection Act of 1972. So to touch a marine mammal or harass them or get close to them, you need to have a permit. So our stranding team has a, a permit through National Marine Fisheries. We update it every three years. Um, and that means we can go respond to a marine mammal, we can transport a live animal, or we can pick up a dead marine mammal and take it back to Harbor Branch and do a necropsy on that to find out what the cause of death was. Um, we also have a photo ID permit that lasts for five years. 
Uh, we're in our second year of that permit, and that is also through National Marine Fisheries. And I'll talk about that later in the presentation of what animals we take photographs, uh, marine mammals. Obviously in the Indian River Lagoon, it's gonna be your Atlantic bottlenose dolphins, but we have uh, other animals offshore that we're always looking to photograph and study. Our overall goals and objectives is our team serves as a service department to the university. That means the quality data that we collect is put in a database and that way we can work with other researchers at Harbor Branch and scientists or throughout the state or country or world to work on marine mammal research projects. So our goal is to be out in the field, work with the animals, collect the data, um, do quality data control so that other researchers at Harbor Branch can work on research projects. We do a lot with our uh, veterinarian, Dr. Annie Page Cargin for that. Strandings. Um, so in, our program started in 1999. Um, as I said, I've been there almost 13 years. So I started in 2010. But since that time, uh, we've responded to over 247 stranding events in just our area. Um, we've done, um, and that includes 324 individuals and 15 different species of cetaceans. Uh, that's the word for marine mammals. Uh, dolphins and whales, and we've also had two pinnipeds. We had a couple seals uh, before my time at Harbor Branch that decided to be snowbirds and come down during a cold season, all right? Necropsies, all right, so we all, as I mentioned, we do necropsies, and we're trying to find the cause of death. Not all the times you can find that cause of death. Either the animal died of old age, but we wanna get samples from that animal, and see what we can find out, or if there was any human interaction, did our, as a humans, did we cause the problem for that animal to die? So we have a beautiful air conditioned facility at Harbor Branch where we can bring most of our uh, stranded animals, dead animals back to and do a full necropsy on them and take samples from them. Rescues, favorite part of my job, I love this. Uh, this is where we work as a team through National Marine Fisheries approved interventions or rescues with other partners such as FWC, National Marine Fisheries, Clearwater Aquarium, SeaWorld, you name it. Uh, we work together as a team to uh, catch dolphins in the Indian River Lagoon if they're entangled um, and we'll disentangle them and most of the time release them back out into the wild. So you can see why I like that a lot. Uh, it's my favorite part here. So here we've got a very chunky, uh, uh, so to speak, cap. So very good. And in this photo, uh, you can see the line and scarring on its uh, thorax there. And then we put the clips on the uh, dorsal fin because it didn't have a distinct fin. And we wanted to be able to find that animal again when we released it back to the wild. But in this photo, um, we've disentangled the animal already. We're just documenting the injuries so that we can keep track of that in the future and see how it heals. But since 1999, we've done over 55 um, interventions or rescues throughout the state of Florida. Transports. Uh, we have a beautiful marine mammal ambulance. So if you ever see us driving, and again, we go over in the state, please wave to us, say hi. Um, we may be going somewhere or we may be going to an education event as well. I didn't bring it today. Sorry, folks. Um, but um, we do have this transport vehicle that we can uh, use to transport uh, marine mammals in. Uh, photo ID. This is where you may see us on the river. Um, again, as I said, we have a permit. When you're out there on your boats in the Indian River Lagoon, you must stay 50 yards away from the dolphins. Give them their space. Let them do dolphin stuff out there. Uh, for us, we have a permit to get all the way up close to them. So we're taking photos of their fins um, to find out who's who. And I'll tell you a little bit about that when we get to that slide. And then education outreach. Um, and you can see the back of the ambulance there with the crane. We do a lot of education outreach. This is our first for the year, but we typically averaged over 25 events per year. Last year, uh, we had 35. So we're always trying to go out and talk to the public about what you can do to help marine mammals in your environment. Um, quick question for the audience here. Um, you can see in the top right corner there, we're working with law enforcement. Why do you think we work with law enforcement? Anybody? Perfect. First responders, yes. My team does not live at Harbor Branch, even though it seems like we spend most of our life there. 
So typically when somebody calls in a distressed marine mammal, law enforcement is first on scene. So we want them to be able to stabilize the animal till we arrive on the back end. And then we work together as a team for that animal. All right, so why is it important to respond to marine mammal stranding events? We wanna find out what's going on, possible causes of why they stranded, uh, especially here big in the Indian River Lagoon is the harmful algae blooms. Um, we wanna see what's happening to their environment on uh, if there's lack of seagrass, then obviously there's not gonna be a lot of fish. So then possibly they could starve to death. So we wanna find out what's going on. And as I mentioned, sometimes we just don't know. It's just dead. We did all the samples. It was not conclusive. And that's all we have. Um, what do responding to events uh, provide for our team? It gives us the ability to practice, uh, get new staff trained up, get volunteers trained up, um, keep our skills up. But also we get to see certain animals that may strand along the ocean that are not close to the beach. They live thousands of miles offshore. And because they were either ill or sick, stranded or gave up on life and just the current brought them on to sea. So you'll see that in the next couple of slides, I believe. So again, obviously when you see a dolphin like this wrapped up in fishing line on its tail fluke and that's scarring over the line, and then you see the veterinarian on the right side uh, cutting off the line and you see all the bio uh, fowl on that with the seaweed and everything that's making a drag. And so, yes, we do wanna help marine mammals for this. Get them untangled and get them back out into the wild. Or we may have to help with spinner dolphins. These are a deeper water animal species. They're farther offshore. So you don't get a whole lot of time to get the hands on to study these animals if you're only a scientist working in a lab. They're way out there, but sometimes these guys strand or a melonhead whale, melonhead whale, uh, looks like a dolphin when that call came in and said, hey, we got a dolphin on the beach, uh, ended up being a melonhead whale. And if you look, it's got like some white lips on there. So that's how we could tell that species. But again, deep water animal shouldn't be on the beach, should be far offshore. So again, scientists get a chance to sample this animal and find out possibly why it died or uh, stranded. Gervais beak whale, um, there's, we respond to five species of big beaked whales in our home environment. Um, this is a Gervais beak whale. Um, again, uh, it seems to me in our stranding area, every three years or so I get a beaked whale, a deep water animal. They can hold their breath for over an hour. They're way offshore um, and so really unique. And as I said, working with other scientists, there's a gentleman in Poland that loves beak whales. And when we turn in our 24 hour report, immediately I get an email from him. I have all the photos, can I help? He just loves beaked whales. So it's kind of cool to uh, share that with him and see what he can find out with that species of going on. Findings. So when we bring an animal, a dead animal back for a necropsy, um, we want to find out what's wrong with it. Uh, anybody from the audience have a guess on what possibly killed this animal or why it's stranded? Starvation. You can see its ribs and its vertebrae. That's, it shouldn't be showing like that. So this animal unfortunately starved to death or was sick where it just couldn't hunt anymore and eat. Uh, this is a Koja brevicep or pygmy sperm whale. Um, so pygmy sperm whale looks like this on, on cartoon version. <laughs> and so it's our number two strander for our area behind Dolph, Atlantic bottlenose dolphins. And so this is just a finding sheet that we do, basic, basic morphology. And we want to check um, links on different parts of the body for it. Um, if you're looking at this chart for the audience, uh, notice the teeth count. Does anybody notice something that's different on this animal? The upper, no teeth on the upper. Yeah, this species of marine mammal has no upper teeth. It's kind of got fangs. And so it eats squid and it's got holes in its top pocket of its uh, uh, gum line where the fangs go in. So it has no teeth on its top jaw, only on the bottom. All right, sometimes we'll find um, when we're doing an necropsy, and again, the animal's stranded, um, and then when, again, part of our job being scientists, we'll cut that animal up, get samples, and when we're in the stomach, 
we'll find human interaction. Uh, this is a plastic bag. It was all wadded up in its first chamber of its stomach, which clogged up the stomach, and the animal wasn't able to eat anymore. So it basically starved to death. And uh, dolphins and whales have three chambered stomachs. So the first part is where the fish or squid gets broken down into. All right. Uh, as you know, rescues are my favorite part of my job. Um, so this is a real quick case study on NIP and NIPT and her calf. And you're going to notice that we give the dolphins four letter names. So I didn't name this animal, um, but um, you can see she's dragging a red crab buoy from the river, but not the pot. So it's just the buoy. So what was really great is if you're out there in the public and you see a dolphin in distress or see something like this with a dolphin dragging it, please call the FWC hotline. I'll have that on the last slide today. But it's almost like this dolphin was carrying a red balloon down the river. We got calls every 10 minutes, which was great because now we knew where she was and we could get an intervention or rescue to her because everybody was calling it in. So working with dolphins in the Indian River Lagoon, we use a net. We're not trying to hurt the animals. They don't know they're trying to be rescued. And NIPT actually had a baby dolphin that was not entangled. So um, it's all approved by National Marine Fisheries. We'll do it in shallow water. Human safety comes first. So we'll encircle our target animal. In this case, there's three in this photo, but just pretend it's two because it's just nipped in her calf and encircle them in the net. And then we have chase boats that go around to cover the net. So when they hit the net, we have trained staff that can grab the animals and bring them to the surface. And again, in four feet of water or less, preferably. Dolphins can hold their breath for 10 minutes so we can get there in time. So here's the mom nipped in her calf. Um, the mom is on the far side. You can see she's got the bigger dorsal fin and the photo and the calf is on this side. The net has been put around the animals and you can see the, the rescuer in the back there in the very shallows, it looks like she's barely knee deep. So if you're a dolphin in a circle and a net, do you wanna swim shallow water or deep water? <laughs> deep water, you're gonna to try to get away. So you don't see a lot of people on the back there because we're mostly in the deeper water because that's where she's gonna hit the net, all right? We got her, and so here she is um, with all the staff. You could see the net in the background floating out there. And um, you can see the entanglement issue. She had the rope around her left pectoral flipper and around her thorax. And so the first thing we do during a catch is we photograph the injury. We want to find out how did she get entangled. And then we'll disentangle her and then take more photos and then release her back out in the wild. For everybody that's watching or, or uh, listening today, you're probably going, Steve, where's the calf? We put, the calf is actually looking at the mother in the, this left slide of the screen. Um, so we put them head to head and we do not block that view. That way they can see each other and whistle and talk to each other. It keeps the stress level down. All right, cool story. I like to give you as many stories as possible. This is Nipped and her calf, a new calf. Uh, came into Harbor Branch Channel a couple of years later. So not only did the calf from the, the rescue survive, she ended up giving birth to another calf. And I'm sure she's had another since then. All right, so a really happy story for you there. All right, so large whale response. If you look at the map here, we are down on the southeast coast here of Florida, the last one on the, there on the right side of Florida. We are a member of the large whale disentanglement team. So several of my staff have training as well as myself to go offshore and assist the network with large whales. For Florida, that's gonna be uh, North Atlantic right whales and humpback whales, occasionally sperm whales as well. Um, those are be considered your large whales. We currently have 11 baby right whales this season already. Um, and for those that don't know, North Atlantic right whales come down to Florida to give birth, the Georgia, Florida um, borderline. And so 11 have been born this season. They're very endangered, as I, you've had plenty of talks here in the past. For, for the people on Zoom that haven't been here, uh, right whales um, are only 350 left of the North Atlantic species. So every baby counts. And as of today, uh, there's a mom and calf off Daytona Beach. And there's also the um, pilgrim and her calf 
that has passed by this area over the last 10 days was off uh, south of Juno Beach Pier this morning down by Lake Worth. So hopefully she turns around and starts heading back north. We don't need her to keep going south. Uh, but again, they come down here to uh, give birth and raise their young for a couple months before leaving. All right. All right. So for those that don't know, uh, this is Pilgrim and her calf from yesterday off of uh, Hope Sound. And so she's doing great, just doing mom and baby stuff. We just need all the boaters to stay 500 yards away from her. So that's a red flag for you there. Hey, Steve said dolphins, you got to stay 50 yards. Well, humpback whales, you got to stay 100 yards away or a football field lakes. And for this species, you need to stay 500 yards away from them. Give them their space, all right? So for our large whale response, we have a great 24-foot 24, uh, 24 zodiac boat. We can go out the inlet and we can photo um, identify the large whales that were entangled or, and turn that into the uh, whale team from FWC and the Georgia DNR um, team. And so that they can come up for a plan to disentangle the whales. Uh, this is a snow cone from last year off Georgia. All right. And then um, the difference between working with large whales, entanglements, and dolphins in the river is when you're working with a large whale rescue, you never get off the boat. I know there's YouTube videos out there of snorkelers with a knife, uh, but in the United States, you stay on the boat because you can get entangled in the gear and you will never be seen again if that whale takes a breath and decides to swim under. So everything is done on the boat. So in this photo here, uh, the staff from Center of Coastal Studies up in uh, Cape Cod, Provincetown, there's a humpback whale dragging a buoy in the photo. He's throwing a, uh, if you want to call it like a Batman grapple, over the line and they'll bring the line to the boat and then they'll work off that, all right? So for our team, some of the response tools we have is um, if approved by fisheries, if we have an entangled whale in our area, um, we're able to throw the grappling hook, if approved, bring the gear to the boat and attach the satellite buoy. And that way we won't lose the whale. If it gets dark and we have to come back, we can find it by satellite. So we have that ability um, for that. And this is our gear that we have. And so for those, does anybody remember Clipper, the right whale that came into Sebastian in 2016? Oh, okay. A, lot, a few in the audience do, and a lot of people are maybe new here. So everybody knows in the audience where Sebastian Inlet is. And in the winter of 2016, Flipper decided to come in and be a snowbird for about 36 hours into Sebastian Inlet. All right. So as you can see, this is on the left side of the slide is the jetty on the north side. Um, the ocean is uh, where you're looking at. And then on the back side, it's the Indian River Lagoon. And then there's an aerial shot on the right side of the ocean on the top of the slide, and then how the inlet comes in and then shallows out into the Indian River Lagoon. So uh, Clipper decided that she was gonna come in and then hang out here, all right, for 36 hours and then head back out, all right? So here she is. Um, they're really hard to see. They don't have humpbacks, uh, humps on them. So. That's the right whale for you. And then uh, we're gonna just pretend uh, the technology, we couldn't get it today, but it's all good. A fisherman on the jetty actually had him on the morning swimming in, into the inlet. So the tide was coming in. So I think when she went around the jetty, the North jetty, the tide kind of just sucked her and her calf into the inlet. And then when she got in there, she was like, whoa, I'm not supposed to be in here. I need to get out. So we worked with law enforcement and they actually shut down the inlet completely to boaters for 36 hours. Again, remember, right whales are endangered. And she had to get underneath the uh, A1A causeway to get back out into the ocean. But what we noticed over the 36 hours is every time she tried to head towards the ocean, she would turn with the shadows on the bridge for some reason. I don't know why, but she kept doing it. I recorded it a lot with my cell phone off the catwalk. And so she just hung out with her calf. And then if you saw this video, we've got to pretend, but I had it on cell phone. She, uh, the, they, the current was going out and sucked her calf through underneath the bridge out to the ocean. And being a good mother, she followed her. So this is the photo of them going through the surf uh, through Sebastian Inlet. And then about six months later, 
she was up in uh, Canada with her calf. So six months later, she headed back up there. Now, there's a sad story to this because the following year, Clipper, the mother, was struck by a boat in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And that's their number one threat is human uh, interaction. He's a uh, ship strikes and entanglement issues. So the mom is no longer, but they did name the calf uh, Sebastian. So after Sebastian and Lynn, I don't have an update on the calf, but um, hopefully it's he or she is doing good. All right. So there's a lot of whale alerts. Um, I don't have the updated version for this season because it's still ongoing. But for our area, we'll plug in on a map any whale alert we get. Um, so we've got uh, humpbacks and right whales on this map. And in the green is could be the same mom. She's just moving along the coast. So please don't take that as these are, oh, my God, look how many whales were there. It could have just been the same mother and calf. But we just like to track where they go in our home area. So you got Cape Canaveral up the top and then back down to uh, Harbor Branch here. All right, uh, moving on, photo ID. Um, so as I mentioned, we take photos of the dolphins, body condition, dorsal fins. We have five objectives. Uh, we're trying to find out the health of the animals. Um, we also want to do cradle to the grave. That is, if we know when they were born and when they died, we get a timeline. And maybe we've got some history on that animal. Maybe it was sick for a long time, and we finally follow, connect the dots with it. Um, human interaction I already talked about, and then just getting baseline data. How do we tell the animals apart? Dolphins, that is, is through their dorsal fins. And so all the dolphins are unique, just like everybody in the audience and on Zoom are unique. We all have different faces, different looks, sizes. For the dolphins in the river, um, they've got different fins, and we call them distinctness. Um, you can see some have had some injuries like flop or curl. Uh, I didn't see it happen, so I cannot just say, oh, they were hit by a boat. I don't, I don't know, but, you know, entanglements and boat strikes are common. Um, and so these are some of the animals in the lagoon that we, we know. And my photo ID team is so good that when we're out doing our monthly surveys, they just rattle it off. There's flop, there's curl. And I'm like just driving the boat going, how do you know that? But that's all they do all day long, all week. It's just going through the dorsal fin photos. All right. So for us and working with scientists, our work needs to be repeated. All right. So in the photo on the left here, uh, this is the St. Lucie Inlet. Oops, went back there. This is the St. Lucie. Oh, I did it again. Let's see. Um, uh, right there. Let's see if I can get that right. This is the St. Lucie Inlet area and then St. Lucie River. So you'll see that we zigzag across the lagoon. And then this is the run all the way down to Jupiter Inlet, which is really skinny. So we can see both sides of our run. So one month out of the uh, year, We'll do a crisscross this way. And then this, the next month, we do the crisscross the other way. This way, we cover both sides of the lagoon and don't miss the animals there for science. Now, the animals don't have to be on that track line. If we see them on shore way off, we don't go, hey, they're not on the line. We don't need them. We do go and photograph them. But our work needs to be repeated by somebody else. So that way, we have these strict uh, transit lines that somebody can follow and then do future research with our work. When we do offshore work, we used to do it in a box form, but there was just no way to get it done in a day. So we do a random general, general uh, plan and we just go straight out. So um, the Gulf Stream is out here. And for those that are down in the South area, it's only about 10 uh, miles offshore. Well, out here in the northern part of our area, Sebastian Inlet, it's almost 18 miles offshore. So we're trying to find different species of cetaceans offshore. So we may just do one straight line out, and then sometimes we'll come back and do a one back in. It just depends on the weather and sea state. And as I mentioned, uh, human safety comes first. Maybe Supreme. Uh, that clicker's not going. Oh, there it goes. Was that you or me? Okay. So again, um, real quick here. Um, this number is not up to date, but we have over 200 dolphins in our catalog for our home area, including uh, baby dolphins. And we'll be updating that shortly for our uh, yearly report to NOAA. Um, and then, okay, perfect. And then you can see some seasonality uh, from last year's study here. 
Um, so for if you look at the left slide here, that's um, north of Harbor Branch, the Indian River County area. Then in the middle is going to be your St. Lucie County. And then the third area is Martin County. And what we've noticed in all those plots there where we saw dolphins, when we went by, it doesn't mean they just stay there because they're swimming all the time. It's when we saw them at that time. But what we see for our home area is an increase of Atlantic bottlenose dolphins in the river during the winter and in the summertime, less animals. So we want to find out where they're going. We have a good idea. They're following the fish as they move up to this area. And so we can work with our partners at Hub SeaWorld Research and figure that out. Hey, do you have an increase of dolphins in your area in the summertime versus the opposite in the winter? All right, I mentioned this already uh, for the straight lines offshore, but we have over 111 Atlantic bottlenose dolphins in our offshore catalog, including baby dolphins. And then one of my new favorite animals, Atlantic spotted dolphins. Uh, we have 52 in, in our catalog as well. Um, and we've seen the spotted dolphins about 20 miles off the shore of uh, Sebastian Inlet. All right. If you want to learn more about our offshore works and when we plug these in, when we update it every quarter, uh, you could go to this map and it's also on our website page. Um, it's Oba Sea Map. And you can see all the plots of where we've seen different species of marine mammals offshore during our offshore surveys. And now this is the time where I get to talk about the animals for the offshore. Uh, we have Atlantic spotted dolphins we're looking for and permitted to bottlenose dolphins, humpbacks, long thin pilot whales, uh, pantropical spotted dolphins, pygmy sperm whales, risos, rough tooth, and short fin pilot whales. That's my wish list on my permit. And you may notice that North Atlantic right whales are not on that list. Because they're endangered, uh, we do not harass them. We stay 500 yards away. Um, but we are able to come up the humpback whales. But yes, you can log into Obis Sea Map at that link, type in FAU Harbor Branch, and you can get the latest update plot map metadata for it. So if there's any researchers out there that want to work with us and our team on dolphins offshore, there you go. Um, OB, just Google Obis Sea Map, and it's run by Duke. Uh, for the uh, somebody asked, what was the website again? For those that are listening at home, um, it's Obis Sea Map, and um, it's run by Duke University, and it's for all over the uh, world. Actually, they put in metadata everywhere, but you can just type in FAU Harbor Branch and play with that. All right, Atlantic spotted dolphins, for those that don't know what they look like, this is uh, some animals off of uh, Sebastian Inlet. Um, the adults have spots and the calves do not. So they get their spots as they age. Why are they my favorite dolphin now? Because they won't leave our boat alone. <laughs> so they will swim right up to our boats and we just shoot photos and it's the Atlantic model and those dolphins try to swim away. They don't really want to be bothered. These guys just love our boats. And then when we're done with them, we kind of have to ditch them because they want to follow us. Um, but for as a photo ID team, it's great because you can just shoot away and get all the photos you want. So that's why they're my favorite dolphin offshore. All right. How can you help? Um, for the audience here that y'all live in Florida, the best way to help is 888-404-FWCC. That's manned 24 hours a day, 365 days out of the year for the state of Florida by FWC. If you see a marine mammal in distress, dolphin or whale, or manatee or another animal call, and they will get a group like Harbor Branch or another local group, depending on where you are, to respond to that animal. Um, for those that live out of state watching on Zoom, please just look up your local phone number for your state or area. And also, um, Dolphin and Whale 911 is a free app made by NOAA on um, Android and uh, Apple phones. So you can just download that, take a photo of a stranded animal, and it actually puts your GPS points right there, all right, and send it. All right. Just remember when you're out on a boat, please stay 50 yards away from the dolphins. Please be smart. Drive slow. Um, if you're fishing, uh, pull your line up, have a sandwich, have another beer, check your cell phone, let the dolphins swim by. They're going to scare all the fish away anyways, because the fish are going to know they're there. Wait till they clear your boat, then throw your line back out and have a great time fishing. All right. 
Um, I do want to thank my team, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, I can't do it without them to do this work. And then I'd like to thank the Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute Foundation. My team applies for grants from these specialty license plates to do this work today, uh, the dolphin and whale plate. So if you have one of those in the audience, thank you very much. You can see what your funding is going to. Um, if you're on Zoom and same thing, all right, so thank you. And then again, all these groups helped in all these photos. So acknowledgements are key, teamwork is key, and collaboration is key working with marine mammals. So I wanna thank all our partners here. And if I'm missing anybody, I'm sorry, we still think about you and thank you as well. And then um, if you wanna learn more about Harbor Branch and its offerings, you can always uh, go online, uh, click in FAU Harbor Branch and find out about the lecture series that they have during the winter time or anything tours um, and uh, be a donor. And then lastly, if you ever saw the movie Dolphin Tale 2 with Hope, um, that's my friend Hope, uh, I was part of that rescue. And so uh, I got to see her at Clearwater Aquarium many, many years ago. So kind of makes me realize what the job is all about is helping animals and helping scientists get data. And that's all I have. And I'll be turning it over to Sam who's gonna be talking about um, the Dolphin Spotter Citizen Science Project. And then I think we'll do a joint question and answer time at the end if that works for everybody. So thank you very much. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Sam once again. I am currently an outreach specialist at FAU Harbor Branch, but I actually started my journey at FAU Harbor Branch back in 2017 as an undergraduate student. I was doing the Semester by the Sea program. It's a one semester long program where you get to take all of your marine science related electives at Harbor Branch with a scientist there. So it was during that semester that I decided I wanted to apply to the Marine Science and Oceanography master's degree program. And I got accepted to that officially in 2020 and ended that in 2022. So I started full-time right after. So really comforting to have a full-time job right after graduation. Um, but I'm here to talk about Dolphin Spotter. So this is a perfect project that complements Steve's work uh, that they're doing um, at Harbor Branch as well. Um, but also I have a little sign-up sheet kind of being passed around. If any of you want information about Harbor Branch, we have a once a month e-bulletin. So it's a once a month email, no spam or anything like that, uh, that lets you know about uh, just different events that are happening at Harbor Branch or any cool research that's also in the works. Um, so feel free to sign up for that. Those of you on Zoom, if you wanted to sign up for the e-bulletin, you can do that online as well. You just go to our webpage, scroll down to the bottom and click get the e-bulletin. So pretty simple. Um, but before I get started, I wanted to also let you know, um, I also spent some time in Hawaii as well. So I, that was actually my first year of college was back in Hilo, but I was born and raised in South Dakota. So as far away from the ocean as you could get, um, but I was always fascinated with it. And I was able to actually go down to Clearwater Marine Aquarium. That was my first ever experience with marine science or dolphins or anything like that. And I decided I wanted to do something that had to do with dolphins. And so here I am running dolphin spotter. So it worked out. Um, but I wanna talk about dolphin spotter as a program, but also how you can get involved um, and help with it as well. So essentially the goal of dolphin spotter is not only to engage the public in dolphin research and how they can participate, but to also help with Steve's team and their work that they're doing. So kind of supplementing some of those photos so you can actually see uh, this first photo here is a picture that was taken from land um, and it was actually taken in the Harbor Branch channel. So kind of cool. Um, but essentially the biggest part to the project that everyone needs to know is that this is a land-based program. So photos submitted from land work great for our project. We don't accept photos from boats, kayaks or drones. Um, so just because like Steve said, our dolphins are protected under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. And we don't wanna encourage people to chase down dolphins just to get a good photo. Um, for us to do our work, we definitely need to receive those photos that are from land. Um, but it's great for you guys because land is easily accessible. You don't have to own a boat or a kayak. You can go to a park, you can go and take a photo of a dolphin from anywhere. You can be walking along bridges, inlets, um, you know, even uh, beaches, right? 
Uh, so yesterday, actually, I spotted two dolphins at a park in Hero. So I was able to submit a dolphin sighting as a dolphin spotter. Um, but we're also funded through the Protect Wild Dolphins specialty license plate. One fun fact about that is back in 2020, this was actually the fifth most popular plate in the state of Florida, and they raised about $912,000. So most of those funds are actually utilized for research and education purposes. So this whole project has been funded through that plate uh, for our year one, and then we're right now in the middle of year two. So super excited. So like I mentioned before, all these photos have to be taken from shore. And we have quite a bit of a list as to where you can take photos, right? So you can get them from beaches and inlets, canals behind private houses. So if you live along the water, you know, our, our team isn't going into every little finger canal behind everyone's house. So you're kind of helping to fill in some of those research gaps um, that they might not survey. So it's really helpful for our team to know. To participate, it's pretty simple. You can go to our website. So if you go to fau.edu slash HBOI, you can click on discover. And right on the left-hand side, there's a tab for citizen science. So essentially what you're doing is you're participating as a citizen scientist. So you're collecting data, which is essentially photos and submitting that to that. And that is contributing to our research here. Um, so you go online, you register, you'll get an email with a link to the citing form. So on the registration form, you'll notice there's a lot of attestations. That's just for us to know that you are acknowledging the fact that you can't take photos from boats and that also dolphins are protected. So also just for photos as well. So we can use those photos for research, but we can also utilize them in promotional materials like social media and advertising to promote more engagement as well. So once sightings have been submitted, I'm actually populating an interactive map on our website. And so you can go back to the website after you've you know, registered, you've spotted your dolphins, you've submitted the form. You can check back to see your sighting and where it was submitted, but you can also check to see where other people are sighting dolphins as well. So in that middle photo, you can click on one of those little yellow dots and a little box will pop up with all of the information about that sighting, including a photo. So you can see the photo of the dolphin that was submitted. Um, so I continuously check back up on this um, and update this as, as I receive settings. So just a cool update on some of the findings. Um, so thankful to Steve and his team for kind of giving this information to us. But we uh, are the photos submitted by dolphin spotters. Ten individuals have actually been matched to the database and uh, the catalog that they have um, for their individuals that they survey. Um, so I had a couple of examples of some of the dolphins. So we've got these photos are all photos that were submitted by our dolphin spotters. Just to give you an idea of some of the photos that we were able to identify. Most of the photos we get definitely aren't like super clear because it's a lot of people click with their iPhones, you know, taking a picture. Sometimes it's pretty blurry. Um, but these are really helpful because the one here on the left, this first one was Chop or Chopper. Um, and he was actually spotted twice by our dolphin spotters. So two different spotters. Um, and they also gave us some fun facts about some of these animals. And one of the fun facts is that he was also spotted twice by their research team. So it's just kind of cool to think that our dolphin spotters are kind of helping to kind of potentially increase that home range or add information about those individuals in their database. Um, the second one here is Spoiler. So Spoiler was actually spotted twice as well by dolphin spotters. So they're one of two dolphins that have been spotted twice. Um, the first time was actually by me. I was giving a tour at FAU Harbor Branch, and I had some visitors with me, and a couple of dolphins popped up right there on the point during the tour. So we were able to snap some photos and send them to Steve and his team, and they were able to take a look for us. But two weeks before that, someone had submitted a sighting, and we hadn't really gone through the photos. And when we did, we realized that that dolphin was also spoiler. And so he was actually up in North Vero as well. So then he was also down south at Harbor Branch. Summer, all, all the way to the right. So she's a cool dolphin. Um, we actually had a cool fun fact. They were, um, she had an intervention that was approved by Steve's team back in 2021 and she was tidally stranded. So it's cool that we were able to get a photo of her from our dolphin spotters and also provide them with some education on kind of, you know, about the, the dolphins in their area. So they can learn about things, you know, their past experiences, past events, like entanglements or strandings and things like that. Um, but they can also learn about um, health things. So if a dolphin has, you know, something that we call lobomycosis, it kind of almost looks like this white cauliflower look to their skin. 
um, we can teach our, our dolphin spotters about that as well. So it's just kind of cool that we can engage them and educate them about our local dolphin population while they're helping us um, and contributing to research. So an update on some of our numbers, we have over 110 registered spotters to the program. And we actually have that number is now 52 because of my sighting from yesterday. Uh, 52 sightings in total of our dolphins. Um, and so the great thing about this, this is go, it goes from Stewart up to Merritt Island. So Merritt Island is actually further north than Sebastian. So that kind of helps to get some images from outside of our survey area, especially you guys up here. If you spot dolphins in the lagoon and you send in photos, let's say over the summer and you have a bunch of dolphins that you spotted and you send those in and a couple of those individuals are matched to our database that might give Steve and his team an idea of where those dolphins are at during the summertime and other parts of the year that they don't necessarily see them in their survey region. So it'd be kind of great to help sometimes fill in some of those research gaps. Um, so this year, we're actually currently working on a new project kind of paired with Dolphin Spotter, and it's called Spotting Stations. So spotting stations are essentially something that anyone who has waterfront property, like a dock, um, along the canal or even a tree along the water or any a, a post in your yard, you could get a trail camera and you could attach it to that structure. And so what's really cool about this is this is a no glow trail camera. So it's not going to you know produce any light that might spook an animal. As they come up out of the surface and they um, pass through that trail camera, it'll take a motion detected picture of a dolphin in that dorsal fin. Um, now you also might get 2000 photos of trees blowing in the wind. Uh, I've been practicing using our uh, trail camera on campus. And I've gotten photos of probably every animal but a dolphin. Um, we've gotten things from, you know, like herons or raccoons at night, even a bug flying in front of the camera. Um, lots of cool stuff. It's really neat to see. So if you enjoy other wildlife, you know, it'll be kind of cool to comb through some of those photos. Um, but it's also just a great way to have, you know, that trail camera sitting there 24 seven monitoring that area. So we're partnering with a couple of nature centers as well. So we'll be piloting that program with them. But within the next couple of months, keep an ear out for that. That'll be posted probably on our website as well as all of our social media. And it'll come out through that e-bulletin as well. So if that's definitely something that interests you, you can definitely check that out. And you can always ask me questions after as well. So to learn more about Dolphin Spotter or even the work that Steve does or anything at Harbor Branch, you're more than welcome to visit us at our visitor center. We have eight self-guided exhibits that showcases all of the research that's going on at FAU Harbor Branch. Um, a lot of really cool work being done. And with that, we have our tours. So it's based out of the visitor center as well. So it's a one and a half hour long golf cart tour that can take you onto our campus. So the only way to actually get physically on our campus is through a campus tour. Um, it is actually a designated port of call, meaning we do have to abide by Homeland Security measures. So we can't have people just walking in and out of our uh, campus, but we also are doing some classified research with the military as well. So we've got lots of security, um, but this is a great way to see our campus, learn about the research that we're doing, as well as see some of our retired submersibles as well. Uh, that's probably one of my favorite parts in the tour. Uh, but if you do book a tour, I am one of the tour guides, so you'll probably see me again. So we'd love to have you. And then of course we have lots of virtual resources. So if you go online, you can you know, watch a lot of behind the scenes videos. I think Steve actually had done a couple of those uh, virtual videos. Um, and you can also download different curriculums. So we offer homeschool curriculums for different groups. So you're more than welcome to learn about that as well. Um, and then upcoming this month, we have our ocean science lecture series that is gonna start up again. It's free to the public. You can come online or tune in. Um, or come in person or tune in. And so this is free to the public. You just register on our website. It's all actually a really great way to meet research scientists, hear from them about the research that they're doing and ask questions. And we also have a benefactor membership program. This is gonna be updating shortly, um, but it's kind of a donation-based membership and you get a few perks here and there. Uh, but if you're interested, I have more information on that back table as well. Um, and if you didn't get a dolphin spotter, rat card, or a flyer, we also have a schedule for the Ocean Science Lecture Series. There's a table by the coffee. There's uh, lots of flyers out there. You're more than welcome to take them. And then you can sign up for that e-bulletin as well. But with that, uh, if you have any questions for Steve or I, we'd be happy to answer them. Yes. Trail cameras, how many do you anticipate having distributed around? So that'll be up. So the question was, uh, how many trail cameras do we have um, anticipated that are gonna be placed out? So this is gonna be something for the spotter themselves. 
they would purchase the camera, they would set it up, put it on their property and register it to our program. So we're hoping to have as many as possible because we're not gonna be the ones out there deploying them. Um, so it'd be great to have, you know, multiple in certain areas with different angles so we can capture photos from, you know, different areas. Um, but hopefully we'll have a lot. That's the goal. Um, but yeah. Will be downloaded electronically? Yes. So the question was, will it be downloaded electronically? So yeah. So there's a memory card that goes in the camera. So uh, depending on the camera quality, you may get like 2,000 photos or depending on the day, you may have 4,000 photos or however long you leave it there. You can download the photos from the memory card and we'll have a siding form where you can actually upload the photos of the dolphin. I highly doubt there's going to be 4,000 photos of dolphins on your camera. It'll probably be like one or two. So you'd be able to upload those via our siding form. So the yes. dolphins, do they like come in like Cape Canaveral or in, in Sebastian? Do they swim all the way down the canal and out another place? I mean, what kind of routes do they just hang in the canal? Do they go, are they just out in the ocean? Are they uh, the question for the uh, uh, the Zoom members is, uh, do the animals go out Cape Canaveral or they stay in the river? Uh, most of the animals uh, stay in the Indian River Lagoon. However, uh, for Hubs' area, this is Hubs' research area, I do know for a fact that when the Cape uh, Lock is open, there's been times where the dolphins from the river have gone in and Cape Canaveral and then come back out, back in and out when that lock is open. Uh, there's also been uh, some work at Harbor Branch with Dr. Gregor Corey Crow and satellite tags on dolphins where uh, you um, Google his name and uh, tracking where three of the dolphins down in the Harbor Branch area did come out the Fort Pierce Inlet and go offshore. But the majority of the dolphins do stay in the Indian River Lagoon. So that is, but that is one question that I've had for 12, 13 years, and we've only had our photo ID permit for offshore for the last two years. And that is a wish list for my team is to match up, let's say, curl or bird or any of the flop uh, and see them offshore and go, whoa, they are going and using the inlets to go offshore. Yeah. So New Smyrna, New Smyrna, they come in and out the Ponce Inlet. Um, I'll see that. So yes. They may come out and just fish and then come back in, you know, with the tide. It's a good question. Next question. Yes, sir. Go out, what do you say, about 18 miles? Uh, how long does that take you to get out there? And how long do you stay out there? Are you studying just uh, animals, cuts, turtles, or anything? Uh, good, the question from the audience was, is uh, do we go out uh, 18 miles offshore? How long are we out there? Are we studying other animals other than dolphins and whales? Do we look at turtles? Um, so great question. Uh, sometimes it takes all day, uh, depending on how many animals we cite. And once we've cleared them all for our photos, um, and if we just keep reciting and reciting, we will spend the day. Other times we'll have to cut the survey short, depending on weather, um, especially in summer here in Florida, for the audience here, they know that. But for the people on Zoom, in the summertime, we have very... Uh, violent or severe thunderstorms and lightning. So that could cause us to cut the survey short. And that does that means it's not a completed survey. It's an opportunistic survey. So the data is still good. We just got to repeat that again to finish the survey. So um, if we don't see any animals and we're just running at eight to 10 knots offshore, because you want to go at a, a reasonable pace, but not fast because you don't want to miss anything, um, depending on where we are, we could be out for six, eight hours with nothing or all day, sun, sun to sun darkness. Um, other animals, if we see, uh, it depends on what we're permitted for, as obviously we're listed on that. Uh, we've seen uh, leatherbacks out there and taking photos and GPS, but we keep our distance. We'll take photos. Um, our veterinarian uh, has a turtle permit, so we usually share that data with her. I've seen a manta ray off Disney. Um, for those that are on Zoom, there's a hotel in Wabasso area. Um, it's a Disney hotel, so don't think it's SeaWorld. I mean, uh, Disney in Orlando. It's a Disney hotel on the beach, and we are maybe a mile offshore with a manta ray out there. So we took photos and took that. But mainly, we're just studying dolphins and whales. So good question. 
Yes. Sir. Sounds like they swim 50 miles a day. Is that their? Um, I mean, it just depends on what species. Um, but I, I don't have an answer for that. It just depends on what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions from the audience? Oh, we've got some on uh, here. Hi, Steve. Thank you again for uh, coming to the Marine Resources Council and presenting today. We do appreciate it. Uh, I have a few questions. What's uh, how many of the 186 necropsies that were performed? How much plastic was found? Do you know? Well, uh, very good question. And come see me afterwards, and I'll have to look that up. So that's going to be a homework assignment for me. Uh, as I mentioned, I started in 2010, so I'd have to go back through the database and check that. Uh, we do have uh, our doctor, our vet, working with a couple of uh, microplastic scientists at Harbor Branch and doing a study on that. So I can tell you from my years, I think I've had two plastic bags. But if you're going for all plastic, I'm not sure how long we've done the microplastic studies. Um, but uh, I can find out for you. So please come and see me afterwards um, and give me your email address and I'll try to get that answer for you. Excellent question. Thank you. And um, the, are you familiar with the what HUBS is doing as far as surveying uh, dolphins in the area? Yes, they're one of our straining partners and photo ID partners. We work a lot with them. Over the last few months, we've spent a lot of our time up here helping them uh, search for entangled dolphins um, and working side by side. So we are, uh, the question was, oh, you have the mic. I didn't see that, Steve. Uh, but yes, we work hand in hand with HUBS. And um, there's a popular manatee, uh, Umi, is that U-M-E? Are you familiar with this manatee? Oh, good question. Um, U-M-E, um, that's not the manatee's name. It's a stand, uh, abbreviation for unusual mortality event. Oh. So currently, uh, there's a manatee unusual mortality event going on in the Indian River Lagoon. Uh, that is uh, something that FWC and U.S. Fish and Wildlife have been working on. Uh, manatees are, again, protected by law. They're a marine mammal. Um, but the permitting agency for that is U.S. Fish and Wildlife and not National Marine Fisheries. But we do work together with them. And their research biologists for that would be uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife. They're the ones responding to manatees. However, they will uh, call for help because we're trained uh, for dolphins and whales. We work with large animals. Um, like I said, it keeps our skill sets up um, and we will help work with them under their permission to uh, rescue an animal or pick up a dead carcass. Um, we had, the for those that are on Zoom, uh, for Florida, we've only had the one cold spell. It was over the Christmas break where it got uh, 30 degrees, 35 degrees here for a couple of days. Um, that has been one of the effects of the unusual mortality event is being cold. Uh, the animals are warm blooded. They get cold stress and symptoms from being cold. Uh, the other is lack of seagrass. And so as Dr. Lisa Soto mentioned at the beginning of our presentation, um, MRC is working on seagrass. And then there's also researchers at Harbor Branch that are working on seagrass too. Because if you don't have seagrass, the manatees can't eat it, but also there's less fish. And then the dolphins don't get it, so it just spirals down. So hopefully, I answered that question on the UME for you. If you'd like more information, I could go and I could talk about that all day, but I could do that off so we can get more questions. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, does H2O and temperature affect uh, migration and feeding? Um, so the, we're looking into water temperature, and that's what we're looking into. Uh, with the dolphins, and that was my one uh, thought off our presentation today. Um, are they following the food uh, up and down the river during seasonalities because the water temperature is changing? Um, and so that's what we're looking into. So good question. Is is, is there any more questions in the audience? Yes. All right, six times. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, to clarify on the manatee question, I was just wondering what if you have heard of the progress of that, the studies? Are they coming to a completion? Or I'm just curious to see what the actual findings are, what's been causing so many damage that we've left now two years. Um, so the question from the audience, because uh, the lady doesn't have a mic with her, 
is was back to the Manatee UME. She wanted to know an update on the findings of the UME that's ongoing, um, research, any results that they have. Um, the best place to get that information is to Google FWC UME Manatee, and they've up, they're updating that all the time. They'll have the, all the screening numbers, all the rescues, everything, and what they're currently doing for the manatees in Florida. I wasn't sure if they were like still researching what the actual causes of that. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, there was a follow up there. She just wasn't sure of what the actual cause of death was. Um, lack of seagrass is one, and cold stress is one. But you can learn more by going onto the FWC Manatee page for UME. Has there been an increase or decrease in the number of dolphins over the last several years? Um, for our area, it seems to be stable at a stable level. Um, so. That's all I got for that answer. And that's for the inshore animals. Uh, we're one of the only groups uh, doing offshore in our area for that. So we'd like to continue to build that baseline and continue to tell you if there's a trend of down or upwards, but it seems to be at a stable line. Uh, thank you for doing this. Also, um, the fins that you had up on the, uh, up there for all the dolphins, are, do you have them somewhere where we can research that while we're trying to give you some pictures? That's a great question. Um, we all our fin photos are on a database um, that we keep uh, that we work on. However, if you were to do the dolphin spotter project, then you could click on there and find out where those fins are. So if you were to be a citizen science and you took a land based photo of a dolphin with that fin, send it in to Sam when she goes through it. I don't know her schedule because we're always busy, but she'll filter through those fin photos, send it to our training team, and then we get back to her. So we would be able to give you a name somewhere down the line. You just have to keep tracking on that. Um, and if you're a member of um, the FAU newsletter, again, you can get more information from Sam. Each month, uh, FAU Harbor Ranch turns out a newsletter. And we actually have in there a fit of the month with a little fun fact for you. So um, I rotate through my team, uh, which animal they want to put in. Um, and so uh, December's monthly uh, was a dolphin named Santa, uh, obviously the holiday season. Um, but we've also had Fizz. Uh, so you can backtrack. I think those are all online and you can find them and find. Uh, we've been doing that since... Um, I think um, May of last year. So you got seven animals online. Um, the interesting reason for that is we have to track all our fin photos for our permits. So the photos that I use today in my PowerPoint, I have to put in my yearly report so that these are image. So I can't just have them out there for everybody to share all that good stuff. I got to keep track of them. Good question. You're welcome. Uh, Thank you. Um, and that's on, the, uh, so the lady asked uh, the right information. So any photo will work because you give us your location on the dolphin spotter, but a clear thin photo, because as you saw, they have distinct markings on um, that way we can tell who's that. Good question. Yes, Steve. So I know that this probably ties into the grass that they feed off of the animals. Um, I've seen things that um, people aren't supposed to use fertilizers and stuff during the, the rainy season, but everybody has drainage that goes into the lagoon. There's fertilizers, there's the Roundup, and it all gets washed in there. Is there anything to make people stop using it up and down the coast? It's yeah, that's so a pouring all the, it's phosphorus and nitrogen right. and then it's bad. <laughs> so uh, to answer that question, it's uh, a super long answer. I'll try to give you the super short version. Here, uh, I, I can't speak for the other counties of Florida. I live in Indian River County. I live in Vero Beach. So we have a ban that you should not be using fertilizer on your lawn during rainy season, which is typically May through October. Not everybody follows that rule. I'm not law enforcement, so all we can do is you know, give out the information, educate the public, and it's uh, the, it's a county issue. I'm telling it in all the stores up and down, you know, I mean, the Home Depot and Lowe's, they should have 
expands on some of this. Yeah. yeah, the question, follow up question there for those who weren't here, couldn't hear was Home Depot, Lowe's, everywhere still sells the fertilizer during the rainy season here in Florida, which is our summertime. Um, and there should be bans. Um, again, uh, I'm just a small fish in a big ocean, and I can only just tell you what you should do, and I'm not law enforcement, so I, I can't help on that other than just please don't fertilize during any time it rains. <laughs> yeah. And it's not just rain, people water their yards when it runs off. And yeah. Good. Yeah. So we can only lead by example. Steve, Sam, thank you so much for coming and sharing with us today. Can we have a round of applause for our vendors? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And for those that are here, um, if you still want to have questions, we can answer over here. If you're on Zoom and you had questions, please just email us at Harbor Branch, and we'll try to get that answer to you. Thank you. Yeah.